welcome to Babble Over Brews, deep thoughts fermented over time and text. I'm coming at you, Aaron Crew Juice Viverka, and I've got Gumby. Hey, what's up? I've got Mike. Howdy. And uh, over there on Skype, I've got Keith. What's up from the bubble? <laughs> so, good evening, gentlemen. I figured tonight, since uh, everything is on fire and the world is burning, uh, we'll go over politics. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Haven't noticed a thing, personally. A nice, calm, non-inflammatory topic. Yeah. <laughs> it's great in my basement. <laughs> <laughs> no, no protest in here. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> 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 Just wait till one of your kids comes down and you're out of ice cream. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to dive in. See, Gumby was down at the beautiful Hocking Hills and he brought us some very cool brews. Yes. From Brewery 33. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Which was a bit disappointed that there was no, I was going there. I was hungry too, but there was no food there. What? Yeah. Oh. So everyone who goes there that are locals, I mean, they obviously know when you go there with your friends and you're having your parties and whatever, you bring food or you order out when oh, you're wow. there. Mm. So I didn't know that. But, yeah. but their brews look good, and I did taste some of them. So. Well, Gumby brought back the Mingo Mango Goose. It's one of our most popular. We use our Gateway Ghost with mango juice for a unique, fresh taste. It's an ABV of 3.9 and IBU of 8. So if we want to break those glasses out. All right. Very cool. Keith, I wish we could bring some to you. So while you were in Hocking Hills, what else did you do? Hiking. Eating. <laughs> a lot of pool table. Ah. We, had, we had a real nice cabin, so, I mean, they didn't want to venture out too much. And it <laughs> rained really hard for two days, so... I put a damper on us going like canoeing. Uh, so, I mean, but we made the best of it. Yeah, we were down in Hocking Hills. Oh, let me see. I think it was two weeks ago. It was yep. two weeks ago. Um, we went hiking, went to, uh, what was it Old Man's Cave? I think it is. Yeah, we went there. Yeah. yeah. It's really awesome. cool, right? Oh, man, it's beautiful. I don't know what it is, but the, the little cutouts where that, uh, they have all the trees in them. Yeah. Um, and, and, where the water is chiseled right through the stone. I know. It feels like you're on the set of, like, you know, Stranger Things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Especially when you look at the root systems, they're going all over the place. It's like, man, this is kind of freaky. <laughs> yeah, I really like it. There's that sense of sacredness there. Oh, yeah. And there's a that one, um, I think it's when you get all the way back to the cave, the final part of, did you get the Whispering Cave? No, we didn't get the Whispering Cave. We all were right. only there for one day, so we just... Did the one area. So, like, the waterfall falls over it. It's just like Last of the Mohicans. Really nice. cool. But Very nice. Cool. Well, this one, it's it's actually hazy. Yeah, it mm -hmm. definitely looks like a, a mango-y, peachy, just looking at it. You can almost see that fruitiness. Oh, yeah. Wow. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and, uh. That ooh. smells really good. That smells like a peach. Mm -hmm. That's like, it, it smells sweet. Oh, I like it. Oh, I wasn't, wow. I wasn't sure I was going to... I didn't think it was going to be full-bodied enough for me. That's actually pretty good. So, it uh, it's crisp. It's fresh. It's way, way mango. Yeah. It's very refreshing. Mm -hmm. It has a little hint of Zima to me. I, I Like, that's a little bit not good. A little White Claw Zima type. Mm -hmm. <laughs> spin to it but i can definitely see having a glass yeah you know to, to kind of quench yourself but this goes good with fish okay <laughs> i don't know i've never had white claw i can't compare yeah i was gonna say i don't need, i've never had zima is it good zima no that's it's like yeah no it's definitely a i don't know when 19 year olds in 1996 would try to get alcohol they lean towards zima it was like the gateway Pass wine coolers into beer type deal. It was the White Claw of the 90s. <laughs> Confession time. <laughs> you know, you know. Can nice. I tell a quick White Claw story? Oh, yeah. please, go ahead. Okay, so 
Uh, last October, they had this uh, thing at the zoo, the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo, where you would go, you pay a ticket, and they have, like, beer tasting all around. Like, it's in the evening, and they got music, and, of course, all the animals are out or whatever. So you pay your ticket, you get all you can drink beer at all these different stands all throughout the zoo, all these super primo beers from near and far. The only drink you would have to pay for is every once in a while, there was a stand selling White Claws for $5. <laughs> Oh wow! <laughs> totally abandoned. I never saw anybody go anywhere near it. <laughs> That's funny. So wait, when is this festival? Because I think our podcast needs to go there. Oh gosh! <laughs> I mean, we could really—it's big enough where you pay the ticket. We could sneak in and record in some corner. I mean, the zoo is a very big place. Oh yeah, there are lots of nooks and crannies. <laughs> Hide behind an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I want to stay behind an elephant. <laughs> there are stories. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but it's it's good. I, I don't know how many I'd be able to drink, but it just has this little hint of maybe bad memories. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. All Wait. Right. So there's an emotional connection. So there. did All you right. get, like, drunk off of, like, Zima? <clears throat> yeah, you would definitely get some drunk off of Zima. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, okay. yeah. So is that heavy? It was heavy enough for new drinkers, hmm. yeah. Yeah. All right. I remember there was another one at that time. It wasn't the Zemo. It was another one, but it was similar. It was, I think it was a Sea Breeze, right? Ah, uh, it sounds familiar. I think I had the Sea Breeze one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was like the competitor to it. Gotcha. <laughs> this has more fruitiness, so it's not quite as just lime, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's definitely almost like a dessert beer. Oh, sure, yeah. Sure, yeah. It's, it's... This would go great with uh, a cheesecake. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Or pizza. Or fish. Yeah, maybe anything. <laughs> it does. It actually. I like it. it it's still. It, it's still a craft to me. Oh yeah. Really? It's. Yes. It's so weak. Like I don't know what is the alcohol by volume on this. So so what Mike's saying is man for it, Mike. there's <laughs> not a, there's not enough testosterone in this beer for him. <laughs> what I'm saying is like you could sneak this in front of somebody and they maybe it seems like a hard cider or you, you could not even know you're being spiked <laughs> you know what oh, I mean oh wow yeah yeah no I mean no, I think, I think so Let's my see. wife would drink this no problem too yeah so yeah. I and she does not like alcohol so she would drink it right. so what you're saying is if you threw this into a Fanta bottle you might be able to trick somebody yeah yeah so I'm like well, that's good juice <laughs> <laughs> wow <Well>, okay <laughs> <laughs> gotta hang out with you more <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying it though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's good. It's the good fruity bear. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, here I put the here I put the growler away. Uh, oh man, come on. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna need. I'm not convinced there's alcohol either. <laughs> <laughs> you should drink until you're convinced. <laughs> <laughs> Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is why we need Keith's voice of reason. <laughs> Speaking of reason, an earlier comment just had me thinking that I know it would ruin, you know, the mystique and the mystery, but I think we should have Jews taste the beers ahead of time to decide what they pair with so he can do things like bring us cheesecake. Oh, oh yeah. that would be phenomenal. Which now I'm thinking about how amazing would a podcast recording be while everybody's eating cheesecake? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, may backfire. Yeah. All right, future plans. <laughs> well, we've been talking about doing our our wives episode or our loved ones or, you know, and we could uh, all sit around, you know, you bring a date and we'll all kick out and we all bring our wives. And obviously they may not want to be on camera, but <laughs> as long as we don't talk theology, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> or politics. Or, or, yeah, yeah. Or, as long as we don't talk. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about my feelings. <laughs> Oh, Lord. <laughs> and now my wife will probably kick my butt. See what happens when you drink mango beer? <laughs> See, there is more alcohol than we thought. So what I pulled for us, I pulled a, a video. It has highlights of the RNC and the DNC because really we're going to want to talk about this, right? So, so I pulled this video. It's approximately 16 minutes, I think, but it covers both sides. Um, so that way we can let people give us a, a quick wrap through and then we can uh, comment on what we're thinking. Anytime somebody has an interjection, just raise your hand. <laughs> All right. Everyone ready? Yes. All right. Selection is the most important 
in the modern history of this country. In response to the unprecedented crises we face, we need an unprecedented response, a movement like never before, of people who are prepared to stand up and fight for democracy and decency and against greed, oligarchy, and bigotry. All right, so right off the bat, that's so Bernie. <laughs> Although I'm kind of charmed by the way he says oligarchy. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It, it's an endearing it's... quality, the way he speaks. That, yeah, I mean, I may not like the guy personally or agree with everything he says, but I'm voting for him because he's a better speaker than Trump. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so That was one of the few segments I actually watched live, and all I could think was, man, that guy does such a great Larry David impression. <laughs> <laughs> <That's hilarious. laughs> so can we set the table a little bit about this clip? What is there an or is there like does it rotate between the NC so, so the first half of the video is gonna be the DNC. Okay. Uh it happened first, right? And then the second half is gonna be the RNC, which came okay. the next week after. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So who so. are the candidates for the DNC? Oh, well that's what we're gonna be going through right now. <laughs> okay. So it's I mean as far as speakers go or Yeah. I mean, now, now mind you, Bernie was still up at the at this point. It, for a potential candidate for presidency. Okay. So, really? Um, wow. Yeah. I mean, if you go by votes. Yeah. And then, of course, because you'll see at one point um, in one of the segments, one of the states had already ha had him as their candidate because that's the way that, that, you know, because every candidate is elected, right? And so the states back and forth will vote. And depending on the votes, it's all tallied up at the end, and then that then that's that's your candidate, right? Mm -hmm. Whoever gets more votes. Do we have any Kanye content on this? <laughs> uh, you know what? I hadn't pulled Kanye. I wish I'd thought ahead of that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just get him off Spotify or something. You know? <laughs> right. I do know that he's really informative because I can no longer go to Chick fil A on Sunday. So Yeah. Oh, nobody got that. Huh? No, I don't get that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Keith got it. <laughs> That's, it, it, I mean, it's, it's a great place to just show up on a Sunday and, you know, smoke a cigarette or something while like, you're leaning against a building, but. <laughs> that's that's one of his big hits, Closed on Sunday. It's all about Chick-fil-A. Oh. oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> Wait, he wrote a whole song about A whole too. song, yep. I have not caught up on his most recent music. Oh, but, it is, oh. it's so bad. I know what it's I'm doing after good. this. It's so bad, it's good. Like, like it's one of those ones where you, you put it on, you're like, wow, this is terrible. I want to hear it again. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm sold. <laughs> it's good enough for me. <laughs> All right. So in late May, after the stay-at-home order was lifted in Arizona, my dad went to a karaoke bar with his friends. A few weeks later, he was put on a ventilator. And after five agonizing days, he died alone in the ICU with a nurse holding his hand. My dad was a healthy 65-year-old. His only pre-existing condition was trusting Donald Trump, and for that, he paid with his life. America is at a crossroads. Sometimes elections represent a real choice, a choice we make as individuals and as a nation about which path we want to take when we've come to challenging times. America is at that crossroads today. I have to give it to him. That was a great visual. <laughs> Because he literally oh, stood at the crossroads. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the, I mean, what he was saying was actually a little boring, but <laughs> but the the crossroads visual was pretty good. That was, was pretty good. Pretty so good. I'm kind of taken back a bit by the girl before her own, her father's only pre existing condition. Was he, was, he was a huge Trump supporter. And uh, that offers so, me nothing. So, so the the background story to that is that, um, more or less, Trump, you know, had said this is going to pass away. Don't worry about it as much. So, he ended up going out with his friends during COVID because he said, "Hey, Trump said it's okay." <laughs> now, mind you, that's again, that's a half back and forth, right? We could go either way with that story, but. That's what he had told his daughter the night he went out. Hey, Trump said it's okay. We're, we're going to be fine. And so he went out with his friends, ended up getting COVID. 
and then he died. So, so every everybody on the news, like this, so that was the first night of the DNC, and um, I wish I was trying to look up her name to give her credit where credit's due, um, but like you know, it kind of got lost by the night four because everybody just forgets what happens the day before, you know, in, in regular life in general. But that was probably after anyone named Obama, that might have been the most impactful speech of the entire DNC. Um, just that line with, you know, his only pre-existing condition was supporting Trump. And I think in general, it's it's a really good point that in an age when you have a pandemic and your personal behavior like really can kind of affect if you and others get the disease, which can affect if you and others get really sick or die, like anything like a pundit says or a politician, like anybody with an audience who says, you know, this thing is a hoax, this isn't real, go do whatever you like, says these things like your what you say can literally kill people. Like I even think of like there's one state representative in Ohio um, who is just going on and on about, you know, uh, you know, Amy Acton, the health director, is, you know, part of a Jewish conspiracy theory and Mike DeWine needs to be impeached and all that stuff. And I'm like, every time he posts on Facebook, I'm just thinking, like, for all I know, he's probably killed five people with that post. Hmm. Like, yeah. I don't, it's a big deal. People people pay attention to what these folks are saying, even if they're not particularly smart about saying it, just because they have power and influence in an audience. Yeah. And, and the way he undermines his own health officials really doesn't help. Yeah. You know, so it's like he is has been a terrible leader for supporting his his own support team. And he does a terrible job supporting people around him. And again, I'm I, I'm not I'm not pro Trump. I'm not really anti Trump because I'm not, you know, Republican or Democrat. Hmm. Um but uh if you are a president, you have to support the people around you. Otherwise, that undermines your own credibility. So, just saying. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a blur. It's been happening so long. I, it's And I guess I maybe uh, I have an advantage because I never really took Trump serious as far as what he says. So, like, you see it spinning up. You, you see this epidemic starting in China, and you start, if you're a, I don't know, logical human being your your kind of spidey senses go off and you're like okay I'm going to be aware of this and and Trump coming out and saying ah oh, it'll blow over it's just the flu type stuff I don't know if that I think that's a little bit of a fear mongering I wouldn't say like if you're billing that as one of the powerful speeches of the night I I I kind of have a problem with that speech of itself I I feel like yeah that's putting a little too much emphasis I mean maybe some people are that sort of like gullible but you know I don't want to sound insensitive but shame on them you know in a way for for doing that for putting that much faith in anything and not researching it yourself yeah yeah. Well, let's look at it. Let's look at a more subtle example, though. For instance, so we had a bunch of confusion for months about whether or not we should be wearing masks. Yeah. And we finally got to the point where everybody was like, most everybody, at least in public, was like, oh, you have to wear a mask because it was like now the law or a, an order or whatever. We had so much confusion about how to wear a mask that I think the bigger issue now is nobody knows how to wear a mask. Like everybody's like sticking it like under their nose because it's like, oh, man, maybe I can get like, uh, COVID from myself or something by breathing back my own germs or, or something ridiculous. Ugh. And it's just, even for like smart people, cause I think a lot of people in a vacuum at least aren't like blatantly dumb. Like there's so much misinformation going out there. Like sometimes I even question myself, like did a pandemic really happen? Like everybody else is partying. Can I go out and party? <laughs> like, I don't know. It, it messes with your head. There's yeah. like, I guess gaslighting is what you call it, where you, where you say things that are wrong so many times that people start to question, you know, if it's true, <laughs> they're questioning yeah. themselves. Well, I mean, it, if that's the case, if we're talking specifically just with the pandemic and with people who need to watch if they have a huge influence about whatever it is they say, then we can attribute a lot of that confusion to Fauci himself. Oh, you don't need masks. Well, we, now you need masks. Well, you don't really need masks all the time. Well, you should really wear masks. When I when I see that when I hear that story about that father going out, you know I could see some of myself in that, and I know my body. I'm going out. I'm healthy. I have some friends who are okay with it. We're going out. If I were to catch COVID and die from that, I can't blame that on anybody 
but myself. That's that's I'm a hundred percent agree, and that's a great way to articulate what I was thinking too. Yeah, and so, but when people are in grief, it's very easy to want to find someone to put that grief at and want to redirect that grief and have someone to, to attach it to instead of saying, "Dad, why did you do that? I'm angry right, with you." Right, right. Yeah, and and I I do get that. I, I do get that, but think of it from the because we're gonna get, we're gonna touch on you know nationalism later, but yeah. think of it from <laughs> think of it from a, a huge Trump supporter. I I trust what this man is saying, <laughs> and he undermines what all of his medical medical experts are saying. No, no, I'm gonna trust him. He knows what's going on. He told me right. So, and I hate to tell you this, but there are a lot of those people who are that gullible following Trump. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely been confusion from the top from the White House. Yes. And you can see that, but it doesn't negate personal responsibility. Agreed, and that's what I mean. It's more like it's no politician's responsibility for me to take actions for my own health. I agree, (laughs) including our president. But is it a responsibility of a politician to say definitively and clearly and correct themselves of the wrong and then say it definitively again? What is a proper precaution instead of going back and forth, back and forth? If we are assuming if big if that they're going to be honest about it i mean do have politicians lied though ever <laughs> <laughs> certainly That's, they do but no. clearly somebody's communicated this property in italy the uk etc cetera, etc cetera, places that had really bad outbreaks but oh, actually yeah. got them under control south korea japan like i don't are we just stupider than that <laughs> maybe uh, maybe more stubborn italy um, well, we count differently than a lot of other countries. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. I will say this: the um, I, one of the one of the countries that handled it the best was New Zealand because yeah. they listened to their health officials and the politicians stepped back and they let the health officials take control. And they said, "Everybody, grab your supplies, go home. We're going to take care of all of your financial needs." For four weeks, two COVID cycles. And right after that, they had zero cases. And it's because they took it seriously. And the government let the health officials stand up and do their job. Mm-hmm. And they had no cases after that whatsoever. Yeah. Yes, I agree. And New Zealand is top of my list to travel. You know what I mean? But there were people complaining in New Zealand, just like Americans were complaining. But my thing is like, New Zealand's a speck on the microscope compared to a whole, you know, the, and they were able to shut their borders faster. That's true. Their people did cooperate. I feel like it's an antidote, antidote, whatever, whatever the difference anecdote. is there. Yeah. Anecdote. <laughs> um, yeah. It, it is a good anecdote and it's a good case study, but I don't think it's just like, it was that easy. And I do think CDC was not, yeah, we Trump, I agree. He's a horrible communicator. But uh, CDC didn't do. They were waffling too. So I don't know the timing of the lady's speech about her father when when that happened. But I would just say, and not to let the cat out of the bag of how I'm going to be probably this whole podcast is, <laughs> I, I hate that like we use this sort of uh, the reason to vote for this is because we don't want that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I hate that. Like yeah. like give me something to vote for, not something to avoid. Yeah. You know, and so I do think like that's just that's kind of like marketing and fear mongering what, yeah. what she said and to lift it up. It's a shame she's turning her dad into a political thing like that. Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree. With that. I feel like there needed to be more information about that. We don't know all the background no, to that. No, there's there's a lot. We're not going to take the time for it in this episode because there's a lot to the story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what well, we need to do is off to a strong start, though. That next speaker over the past four <laughs> years, a lot of people have asked me. When others are going so low, does going high still really work? My answer, going high is the only thing that works. Because when we go low, when we use those same tactics of degrading and dehumanizing others, we just become part of the ugly noise that's drowning out everything else. We degrade ourselves. We degrade the very causes for which we fight. Michelle Obama. Yep. That was her? That was her. Oh, wow. My eyes are... Yeah, that was her. And and I have to say, I, I listened to it, and I was like, wow. 
very well said. And, and again, I'm not, I'm not, you know, Obama supporter, but she spoke very well. She spoke very concisely, and she had a good, clean message. You know, she didn't degrade Trump, uh, but she did say that he he does not fit the bill and that he's not the man to pull the country through the next four years, but she did not do it in a degrading manner. Yeah. She did it in a very respectable way. Yeah, um, I could, and I could appreciate that. Yeah. I, she was already president, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I would like to, I would like to harp on, uh, on Republicans here a little bit because I am tired. I am so tired of the, and these are mostly, uh, Trumpists. <laughs> Always going out there and saying, "Man, Michael Obama, you know, she's oh, actually geez. a guy. And she had her, she had a sex change." And, dude, if you're one of those people, go just walk off a cliff or something. <laughs> that is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it's 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 terrible. It's it's like you have no savvy whatsoever. You come off as a, as an eighth grader. Knock it off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely not cool. Did Trump say that? No, Trump didn't say it. Uh, Trump supporters constantly say it, or they they degrade Michelle Obama, say that she's a guy, and it's it. Is it usually the older Republicans though? Like every time I've seen it in the news, it's older. It's older. U- Republicans. It's usually old white evangelicals. That's what I. <laughs> I think I think racism will really <laughs> drastically improve <laughs> once like a lot of the baby boomers go sorry audience yes. but man a lot of y'all are racist <laughs> and sexist i can't just <laughs> <laughs> all right so well said <laughs> yeah, where's that theology come from <laughs> right mm. yeah and i have to tell people all the time there was at least five people last week in my social media feeds i, I, I had to correct and i said listen you do realize that if you think that Democrats are evil, you're making yourself look worse than them right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, you know what? I, I'm tired of the whole, you got to pick one side or the other game. Yeah. Right. It's an easy way to keep all of us divided. That being said, though, it, it doesn't matter. Whoever's in office, the first lady and the president will be targets for every conspiracy for everything that goes wrong, for everything that goes right. That's yeah. our politics here in America. That's part of the course. Yep. Yeah. So. Yeah, I agree. So, I, unfortunately, she's no exception to that. Right. right. You know, she seems strong enough to handle it and handle it with class, it seems. So, yeah. I tip my hat to that. I, yeah. I agree. I think that was well said. And, and, you know, sometimes, like at first, it gives me a little defensive, you know, because I do see, I, I just don't like the attack. And it did it sound like it was starting out at that. But, She's right. You know, honestly, he is, you know, mocking Antagonist. people. Yeah, he's yeah, yeah. definitely takes the low ground every time. I So I do think that yeah, I agree with everything. So another line from her speech that wasn't in there, but was the one I think actually a lot of folks right after it keyed off on was um, when she said, the ter- like the words, I hate politics, um, but and kind of went into how, you know, talking to people who are specifically disillusioned and thought that it didn't really make a difference whoever got elected. And um, I mean, I, you know, kind of the big point, you know, in taking it with, you know, say for instance, criticism of Trump in her speech was like, hey, we have like real things could change the moment someone else is in office, especially given the crisis we're in. We could have a different response in terms of, you know, unemployment aid, you know, with, you know, huge rates of unemployment or just how we clearly we respond to having the worst death rate, you know, in the world for COVID um, and that kind of thing. So, um, and I thought that was kind of a good, like, real moment because I think she was saying what a lot of people felt. Like, I see things, and things look like they're really bad at the top, but I also have seen the last X number of years and thought that this doesn't make a difference at all. I don't yeah. disagree. So if I think back to George Bush Jr., the, you know, it's just so, like, that no one crosses the aisle. So if you think of Pelosi, sometimes you think, like, even if it wasn't Trump, there'd be a hard time and there'd be this misinformation and there'd be this battle. And then there'd be these two sides. But going to George Bush, it wasn't that bad. So I do, I, I agree with you that uh, a larger difference could be made with someone who is able to concede at times and work with, work across the aisle a little bit. Yeah. You don't even have to work across the aisle to make a big difference. Like, 
Um, I read, there was a book called The Fifth Risk, and I've heard this in many other places too. There was a rapid brain drain in the administrative levels of government, like the nonpartisan folks um, being replaced with partisan or folks or being eliminated entirely. There's a big set of government infrastructure that have been working on our behalf in the midst of a pandemic that George W. Bush would have kept in place, Obama had in place, anybody before them would have had in place, but uh, Trump didn't think he was going to win, I guess. So he didn't really prepare to actually transition these these entities over and um, then also didn't want to really fund them because, you know, it's kind of he was kind of the burn it all down candidate. You kind of got to live up to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All yes. right. Next speaker. So that was one of the states he had won. North Carolina cast 39 votes for Bernie Sanders and 83 votes for the next president of the United States, Joe Biden. Pennsylvania cast 34 votes for Senator Bernie Sanders and 175 votes for the next president of the United States, Scranton's own Joe Biden. Delaware is proud to cast its 32 votes for our favorite son and our next president. Our friend, Delaware, Joe Biden. In fidelity and gratitude to a mass people's movement working to establish 21st century social, economic, and human rights, including guaranteed <laughs> health care, higher education, living wages, and labor rights for all people in the United States. A movement striving to recognize and repair the wounds of racial injustice, colonization, misogyny, and homophobia, and to propose and build reimagined systems of immigration and foreign policy that turn away from the violence and xenophobia of our past. All right, now somebody has this talking on that one. <laughs> Go so, ahead. So who was that? I couldn't see the name. That was AOC. Oh, okay. Oh, so that was her. Um, that was her speech uh, nominating the per- the procedural thing to nominate Bernie Sanders. Yep. Okay. Okay. I can't even make heads or tails of what she was reading. Yeah, oh. it's it's a lot longer, but yeah, and and I'm not, I'm not a huge, I'm not an AOC fan. She says a lot of legit things, but I almost feel like she pumps a lot of too much of her own opinions into things rather than sticking to straight facts. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. Like, I don't know if I want to address AOC in general, just because she's such a, a young career politician. Like I think she's said some things that are just like way outlandish, but for that token, what she's saying, what she's kind of priming that we're going to have this, turn of culture towards more accepting and more love and that seems like i'm, I'm seeing a lot of biden signs with that like lo- love and embrace and yeah sure that's a that's a great concept and i agree but i'm in a, a wait and see mode you know like yeah like definitely <laughs> trump doesn't seem to like make that field fertile you know and and but i i'm not convinced that a biden office would do it either i mean maybe they would try to accept it but i i really don't think acceptance is always the solution, you know, all except you can't just say everything is good no matter what. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I'm just a little bit cautious there. So I'm going to do a wait and see on this. I'll stay on the fence. Okay. Yeah. So AOC, like, I feel like this isn't her best forum, like, for, the, you know, the formal speech. So, but she is genius on social media. So one of my favorite things I've ever seen a politician do, she went on Instagram Live. This is probably around April or May when they're debating the CARES Act. Um, and she is just in her kitchen and she is mix, like teaching the audience how to mix a drink. You know, she was a former bartender. And so she is, you know, mixing this drink up and every once in a while she's interjecting with instructions, but the rest of the time she's talking about the cares act. And it was just genius. Like, it was just like, you're talking politics at the counter while drinking with AOC. Mm-hmm. And like, I, I think she strikes a chord because she, has you know these kind of pretty humble beginnings um she talks very clearly about government actually supporting people in need and ensuring that everybody has a fair shot and everybody you know has the basics to succeed like health care and things like that 
And um, she does it in this way that's just very relatable to a lot of young people. And I think she's going to uh, have a lot of millennials really excited about maybe a future presidency in the future. Yeah, uh, agreed. I, I, and I do like, she's a very good speaker. And when she sticks to, when she sticks to facts, it's very good. The only thing is that she can get a little contentious sometimes, you know, when she's talking about, you know, about the current president and stuff like that. It's like, some other speakers, I think, do us a, a better job at, at saying we need to be above that. And sometimes I think she injects a little bit too much. So I just feel maybe like... I like her clapbacks. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, she's... I mean, he goes low. You can go a little. Like Michelle Obama isn't one hundred percent right on that. You can go a little low. Don't go as low as Trump, but go a little low. <laughs> I think AOC's he's savvy. I do think mm. she's you know sh she resonates with the younger crowd. I just think yeah. there's it's unfair right now because she doesn't have any ramifications to what she says. So when she says things like everybody should have everything that every good person should have, you know what I mean. But there's no way to make a lot of that happen. And I and I fought back was it a couple of years ago where she put out the green act or whatever where it was just like deal. Yeah, green deal. Yeah, yeah yeah and a lot of that was like sure it sounds great. Yeah. But, you know, not knowing how you're going to do it, I just feel like, I don't know, probably one of us can write up something that everybody agrees with and, and we should move towards. But yeah. to me, it's not impressive, you know, because there are so many shackles when you get in the office type deal. All right. Now for what the one that everybody's waiting for. <laughs> Donald Trump says we're leading the world. Well, we are the only major industrial economy to have its unemployment rate tripled. At a time like this, the Oval Office should be a command center. Instead, it's a storm center. There's only chaos. Just one thing never changes. His determination to deny responsibility and shift the blame. So there, Southern Elvis. What do you think? I mean, Wait, I mean Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's Bill Clinton. I should have known that. Well, I don't really have, I mean, he didn't. Yeah, it's it again, wasn't much to it. Yeah, much to it. It's right to the yeah. whole like I, vote I because of he he's so yeah. bad. I don't I don't think he said anything objectionable there. But after um, John Lewis's funeral, what he said there about I believe wasn't Stokely Carmichael? He was kind of bad mouthing him. Am I getting the name right? I hope I'm getting the name right. But he just, uh, he just said the most like racially tone deaf thing. Like I'm like, like like why is he even speaking at his funeral? And this <laughs> after that and between all the other things that have gone on the past. 20 years i'm just like bill clinton please ride off into the sunset <laughs> this isn't enhanced by you talking sit in the back <laughs> hillary knows what she's doing she did before oh. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. go play your saxophone yeah. <laughs> okay moving on how do you make a broken family whole the same way you make a nation whole with love and understanding, and with small acts of kindness, with bravery, with unwavering faith. You show up for each other in big ways and small ones, again and again. It's what so many of you are doing right now for your loved ones, for complete strangers, for your communities. Now, I will say, I was quite surprised in listening to the DNC just how many people of faith were speaking and went right to their faith and spoke about it um i mean it was it was it wasn't forced it was just part of mm -hmm. who they were it was because it was it was natural reference pieces it's like you could tell when somebody's like forced to say something we've all watched you know Trump tried to quote, quote a Bible verse, right? But <laughs> Two Corinthians, baby! Two Corinthians! <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you can tell when somebody's kind of forcing it. I was surprised at how natural it was to a lot of them. Who was it? Who just... That was Joe Biden's wife. Okay. So, um, so I, I was surprised at, at how many people, because... I wonder if Joe knew she was there. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> he probably thought it was his sister. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Sorry, cheap shot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I was surprised because for the way that the Republicans look at Democrats, they look at them as as the godless people, the atheists, the Marxists, the uh, you know just shy of being Hitler, right? <laughs> so, um, but I was but 
I was surprised at how easily, uh, speaking of their faith, did flow out from them. So, hmm. you know. Did she say something about faith? Uh, briefly. Oh. But yeah. Okay. I think a, a, a kind of trend we'll see in the next in the coming years is, and possibly with this election, is a lot of those comments on like, you know, they'll see some folks, you know, still bring out the, you know, you can't be Catholic or you can't be Christian and vote a Democrat. And I think um, people are just going to start tuning it out because they've seen, you know, a pretty amoral administration and combined with people still supporting it, not really pointing out where they fall flat. And so not that we'll be like all suddenly like, uh, you know, Democrats are, you know, singing the praises of Jesus all the time in the convention, <laughs> but we'll probably start. I don't know. I think I think people of faith will be apathetic to the idea of your faith really is in tune with one party. At least I hope that will happen. <laughs> Hopefully. Hmm. Yeah, it's a touchy subject just because I feel like when I was young in my faith, the wool was kind of pulled over my eyes to get my vote sort of thing. You know, yeah. you follow the more mature Christians. Oh, it must be this way only. And then nothing really Christian happens in office. I'm like, oh, well, that was a sham. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, with me, it was just, oh, a Democrat pro-abortion. You can't vote for them. Yeah. You know, they're, they're baby killers, right? Right. And that was it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Guess I should vote for Republicans. Yeah. Well, we bomb other countries, but that's different than killing babies. <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. We send soldiers At out to die. At what point do we, not see, <laughs> do we not see that Yeah, on both sides? So, yeah, I agree with you, Keith. Maybe all the – something needs to change there. The... It's, it's, a cra- it's crazy how, how you can kind of boil politics down to who thinks who should die. Wow. <laughs> Which is really sad. Right? Man, I don't know. I'm going to run for president. Mosquitoes will die. That's it. Oh, and there I'm, will I'm be people, that. and there will be people protesting that. against it. <laughs> we need the mosquitoes because. <laughs> yes, but those people will be overshadowed by all of us. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Next, next speaker. Um, hold on. Four years, people have told me Hillary Clinton. I didn't realize how dangerous he was. I wish I could do it all over, or worse, I should have voted. Mm. Look. This can't be another woulda, coulda, shoulda election. Was she talking about Bill? (laughs) (laughs) I will say I I am (laughs) I am not a uh, Hillary Clinton fan. Um, Never have been, never will be. Um, I think. Hate me if you want. Are you quoting Bill now? What's going on? <laughs> oh! <laughs> <with> those <laughs> that was good. That was good. Oh. You are hot tonight. <laughs> How much alcohol does this have, actually? <laughs> um, I, I think that she, in many ways, uh, represents the worst part of the Democrats, to be honest. Mm. Um, not, and not just from a moral position. Um, I mean, we'll... Well, we won't go into how many people mysteriously die around her and her family, but um, <laughs> when it comes to things like Monsanto's got her in her back pocket. I mean, uh, her and, and it's also parlayed into uh, Obama as well. But um, when you look at who finances them and backs them, their biggest backers are like Monsanto, which is terrible for agriculture, and that's that's one place that really suffered under. Uh, under Democrats was our agriculture. And again, I'm not uh, either or, um, but the Democrats thus far have been not have been terrible for our agricultural um, places in our country. I, I agree so. with you 100% with, with Monsanto. Uh, I will add to that, that Monsanto was a big part of uh the military industrial complex too, though. Yeah. They've gone all the way back to Vietnam, creating agent orange. Right. All, you know, that's to this day ravaged Vietnam and the Vietnamese people. So Monsanto's history isn't just, you know, seeds and making the world a better place by feeding the world. Right. Which is what they claim. Claim. <laughs> uh, they also have ties in, in the military and, and building weapons and all of that too. So it's funny how, you know, we think that one side just votes for one, but mm. Oh, but they, they they own DuPont as they, well. Yeah, I mean, come on. Exactly. They got their hands in all each other's pockets, man. Yeah. And then it's, it's just yeah. dirty. Oh, it's terrible. It's terrible. Yeah. So that's, 
again, that's one place that I see the uh, the Democrats falling flat on their face is when it comes to agriculture, which is actually what I, I was kind of, hey, you can demonize him all day long. One of the good things about Bernie is the fact that he was against Monsanto and he was against all of the GMO companies. So I thought that that was a great platform for him because if you're going to redeem the agricultural people behind you know your country, that's a good way to go about it. You know, yeah. kick kick Monsanto out. You know, uh, all the which it all comes down to Monsanto. They own all of the uh, all, all the subsidiaries, right? So. <laughs> yeah, for, for me personally, having a Hillary in office wouldn't feel no different to me than having a Trump in office. I agree, especially with foreign policy. Yeah, she's just a better communicator. Well, part of the allure of Trump in the beginning was that he was supposed to clean house in a Train way that was, yeah. yeah, and none of that really took play. It was a different sort of just change the swamp sort of thing. Exactly, yeah. um, but I do think that was one of my, like, if, uh, you know, I'd, I hate to admit, I didn't vote because I just couldn't get behind any of the candidates. I could either. Um <laughs> But if I was, I was kind of leaning Trump because I was like, oh, you know, he doesn't need the money and he sh- could clear a lot of this out. Now it's kind of like, oh, well, it wouldn't have mattered anyway. Yeah, he just moved his family in. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, no, I, I, think Hi- Yo, go I think Hillary really emphasizes why, like, I- I've all along thought of Trump winning as being a very pyrrhic victory for Republicans. If Hillary was president right now, the right wing would be so galvanized. Like, <laughs> just just from the just the standpoint of having you know twelve straight years of Democrat rule, um, the enthusiasm gap would just be huge. But after having four years of Trump and seeing you know having a global pandemic, which I mean I thought his candidacy would poison the well for Republicans without a pandemic, and I mean you really are staring down the specter of having you know maybe even twenty straight years without having a, a Republican president. Um, just for for how how much that has you know reduced the the goodwill that Republicans had with a decent chunk of the population. Mm. Yeah. All right. Next speaker. For close to four years now, he has shown no interest in putting in the work. No interest in finding common ground. No interest in using the awesome power of his office to help anyone but himself and his friends. They know they can't win you over with their policies. So they're hoping to make it as hard as possible for you to vote and to convince you that your vote does not matter. That, that is how they win. All right. Who's, who's they? <laughs> Republicans. Republicans. He's nice. not lying on that one. Now, so this is, this is where I think Trump is doing a huge disservice to all of the thinkers out there. Not even... Not Republicans or Democrats, but all the thinkers out there, because he's making it very hard for us, for anybody, to get your vote out there, right? He's trying uh, to shut the uh, post office down, and I don't know about that. That's conjecture. Just vote twice. That's what you do. You just vote twice. One will get in, right? (laughs) Why did I thought of that? (laughs) No, no, no. He so. The person he put in charge of all of that is yeah. buddy of his. I know that. I mean, he dismantled. As soon as he moved in, he dismantled. He also asked for an extra like $25 billion of budget for post office. So I don't know. I think it's conjecture. And he was trying to shut it down before November. It's it's definitely not a good look. No. I'm just saying like no. we can't call <laughs> it facts. Uh, can't call it facts. Uh, I, I honestly don't know what's going on. What, but, what's going on with that? They fired the postmaster, like the the lead of the post office or whatever. Okay. Move one of Trump's buddies in. Yeah, and and like so the um, Democratic side are saying this is going to because there's already a bottleneck in delivery, so they're like this is going to incapacitate any mail in votes, you know. And now they're doing it on purpose. Is is the speculation? Well, and that's because Trump has directly said that he doesn't want people voting by mail. Because of all the fraud, even though there's not a single study that shows that that's a problem. Um, I thought it was the the Russians. <laughs> that, no, those are his friends. I mean, we oh. could do a better job with mail-in <laughs> votes. Like, uh, And I don't know if this is true. I haven't got a, a ballot. But apparently, if you look at the backside of the ballot, if you're registered as a Democrat, it has a D by your barcode. And if you're registered as a Republican, it has an R. And I've seen post office workers just dump their boxes in garbage cans. You know what I mean? So... 
it, it, it would be a concern, but it's a concern for both sides. Oh, yeah. You no, know? I agree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if it's it's not good for either side or for cheating. So Yeah. So let's get to hit Obama's main claim right there. So he said that Trump is uninterested in the hard work of government. He's, un, he's uninterested in helping anyone but himself and his buddies. And so I got to ask, like, does Trump care if I have health insurance? Does he care? I'm a Democrat. Does he care if I die of COVID? We know he, he actually, they talked about how it didn't really matter if the blue states got hit hard by it because that'd be good for politics. Does he care about me? Is he interested in helping me? <laughs> is that a trick question? <laughs> <laughs> or is it rhetorical? <laughs> no, I, I mean, I'd like to hear a defense that he of really cares he about me. Of course he He's not supposed to. I don't think any, I wouldn't think any Democrat president, uh, as much as they would pay lip service. What, what does that mean that they say that they care? I- I think Obama legitimately cared that more people got health care. Really? My daughter my daughter has a heart condition. The only reason we have health care that doesn't cost huge expensive with a huge rider is because of the Affordable Care Act. Wow. So it's interesting because when you got these same people who, you know, through them you may get Obamacare, is that that is that what it is? Yeah, it's okay. the same thing. But yet on the other hand, sign off on dropping bombs in Libya. How do you reconcile the both and say that he truly cares? about people yeah Honestly, i'm not saying i'm not saying he, he did everything right no i'm just saying I, there is especially a with on the human Democratic life and for... human death it's hard for me to reconcile what they say and and to not look at the actions overall that's well, a lot of presidents though well i mean Every i would president. say yeah. i don't know if that's apples to apples gumby i i honestly think like um the best offense or best defense sometimes is a, a first offense so maybe he did truly think he'd save more american lives by dropping, you know, I don't really remember the order of events, but, um, you know, if he thought they, they were going to reduce terrorism by doing this legitimately, I, I do think that's the case. But I, you see how it differs a little bit from like, does he have a heart for the people he's representing? I, I yeah, I kind of. I, I I know. At what point are we? Is it just not politics? Yeah, oh, I mean, fair enough. Fair enough. I would say though, like. At least there's an argument that Obama maybe does care, (laughs) where I'm not so sure I can find an argument. And I don't want to be pro. I'm not. I am anti Trump, but I'm not, you know, I'm not anti Republican. (laughs) Because, Keith, on one hand, I know you benefited personally with your daughter, and that's amazing. I guess what I'm saying is is that I've known people who were hurt by Obamacare too at the same time. So it's hard to reconcile and just say that it's just complete honesty. When you make these bills in in office, there are risks. Yeah, there are. There's going to be legitimate backlash, and there's going to be people hurt. They know that when they make these bills. Yes, so many people will probably be hurt. So many people may lose their job. Some people may actually lose their health coverage, especially like smaller businesses and such, which I've known people who have firsthand who've been crushed financially because of, but there are people who are going to get some health benefits. So I, I don't know. I'm not the one that weighs those scales. I mean, in aggregate, tens of millions of people got health insurance that didn't previously have it. And even the case, I'm in a small business right now. I actually don't have health insurance through my business. Mm-hmm. I actually, because, and this is a little bit of a fault of Obama, this is actually a flaw in Obamacare, but I actually had to beg my employers not to offer me health insurance mm-hmm. so I could get better rates to the marketplace. Mm-hmm. At this point in the game, maybe early on, there were some financial pitfalls for people, but the way uh, health insurance costs have increased, especially under things that Trump has done specifically to sabotage the market, um, I mean, basically health insurance is like a $25,000 a year tax on each employee for a business. Or it's something where it's hugely expensive, but your employees can still go get subsidies through the marketplace and get by. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say, like in the big picture, I think as Americans, we need to move past the fact that we think that Trump is just writing these policies or Obama's just writing these policies himself. They may sign off, hmm. but to call them the brainchild behind these things to get rolled out is a far cry from oh, reality. Oh, no, I'm not saying that. And, you know, Trump, it's it's a pre- their proxy. Like, they go where their party goes, where they go. And, I mean, Trump not caring about health care is kind of, you know, the Republicans not caring about health care. I mean, we saw the plans they put forth a few years ago when they thought about repealing Obamacare, and it was basically like, 
here's a plan that makes it a little more expensive for everybody and 10 million people lose their insurance. That was like the best case scenario for what they were offering. Yeah. And you can, you can tell with Democrats when it comes to healthcare, for instance, they have a pretty uniform policy of wanting to expand coverage, even if it costs more for some people, at least wanting to expand coverage. When he, Republicans are kind of all over the place. Some people, some Republicans like the general idea of the protections of the Affordable Care Act. Some Republicans just want to slash all the costs at, at any cost, no matter how many people lose their insurance. And because there's no consensus there and there's no you know, foundation of we want more people to have access to affordable health care, it means at best there's no policy and at worst they're going to do something really destructive. Right, right. Well, I don't think anybody's going to call him a brainchild, but <laughs> <laughs> it's it's interesting. I heard something different from the Obama clip, like like you picked up on that, um, but I picked up on he accused Trump of having a strategy of discouraging voting. I haven't gotten that. I've actually, um, I think it was that's more of a rallying cry for Democrats to really get out there this time. I think he, he's just echoing what Hillary said. But, I, you know, as far as when I look at the conservative feeds on my Facebook wall and stuff like that, you know, I don't I don't ever see any sort of discouragement of voting. But I do think it's it's weird that it's it's just like so many conspiracy theories on that side, you know, like it's just a, a really weird time for Republicans in yeah. general. I think there's like so many different sects right now within mm. sides you're not lying. Yeah. Yeah, and it's 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 almost like each party is now becoming divided into different parties. Yeah. And and is is Trump really a Republican? Like yeah, from a financial part, but a lot of times, I don't know, he doesn't seem to represent conservatives in a lot of ways. No. Yeah. He's Republican that's... now. Previously he was not. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's that's a good point. I mean, traditional conservatism 30 40 years ago looked different. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, now neoconservatism, that's a whole other yeah. ball game. Yeah. But he does have good words. Does like it? I heard. He said so. He said he has really good words. Bush so. had better words. <laughs> Bush was the best speaker. Yeah, he loved his makeup words. <laughs> Teach a child to read. <laughs> they could pass a test. <laughs> Next speaker. I keep thinking about that twenty five year old Indian woman. Kamala Harris. All of five feet tall. Kamala? Who Kamala. gave birth to me at Kaiser Hospital in Oakland, California. On that day, she probably could have never imagined that I would be standing before you now and speaking these words. I accept your nomination for Vice President of the United States of America. And while this virus touches us all, we got to be honest. It is not an equal opportunity offender. Black, Latino, and indigenous people are suffering and dying disproportionately. And this is not a coincidence. It is the effect of structural racism, of inequities in education and technology, health care and housing, job security and transportation, the injustice in reproductive and maternal health care, in the excessive use of force by police, and in our broader criminal justice system. This virus, it has no eyes, and yet it knows exactly how we see each other and how we treat each other. And let's be clear, there is no vaccine for racism. We've got to do the work. Wow, so even the virus can't escape being a racist. Right? I mean, come on. He he was innocent in this. <laughs> wow, that was like the way too broad. Like, like well, we're focused on the virus or we're focused on, you know, injustice or we're focused on racism. Like, I can see how they relate, but man, she tried to... There's a lot of broad strokes. Ooh, yeah, a lot of broad, put it all like in. Like, that brush was really, really Cover wide. every topic that needs to be covered all together in one 10-second clip. That that was rough. But, I mean, maybe she was only given a limited amount of time. Yeah. I do like the tone of her voice. It's kind of relaxing. It would put me to sleep. I don't know if that means anything, though. Yeah. I, no. Yeah, maybe. I can tell you this. From the way she's speaking, 
somebody on SNL is going to have a fantastic impersonation oh, she, of her. She does a great Maya Rudolph <laughs> impression. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm telling you, somebody on SNL is going to have a great impression of her. I mean, yeah, it's it's coming. It's definitely coming. She impersonates Maya Rudolph? Are you serious? No, Maya Rudolph impersonates. She's already doing... Um... <laughs> oh, gotcha. <laughs> and one thing... So, again, I'm going to harp on, on Republicans again because they're... The, the the racism oozes through a little bit on this because I see so many of my Facebook posts where they're like, oh, look, she's black. Oh, no, look, she's... And they go on. They're like, oh, they can't figure it out. I'm sorry. That that shows that you are racist. <laughs> I don't so, understand. What do you mean? Like, there's so many people who are like, oh, look. Now they're saying she's black. Oh, look! Now they're saying she's she's not even really black. She's Jamaican. You mean I, you're talking about Kamala? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, they keep they keep harping See, on I'm on her up different. I'm never on Facebook. Yeah. I'm never on any of that stuff. So yeah, they keep harping on her different um on her on her different nationalities and and how oh all the Democrats are confused because they wanted somebody who was black and but but she's not wholly black and it's like guys no they they knew who she elected. I mean they're not. You know, they're not confused about who she is. So it's that right there just shows how racist well, they are being. At the very least, I'm sure she's not confused. At and I can tell right. you in liberal forums, they're not talking about that. No. Like, I'm not going to say they don't see color, but I'm saying they're not picking hairs about her specific percentage of different ethnicities. Oh, yeah. I think from a conservative standpoint, some of it, yeah, definitely there's a lot of bigotry. But there's also people don't really want the the race card to be used. You know, like it doesn't have to be first black, this first Hispanic, this, you know, like a lot of times, you know, sure for the black community, that's a great thing and it's an achievement. But yeah. a lot of times it's like, should that be our, our focus? And when it sounds like that's like the, what they're pushing, then it does kind of question that. And like what I heard her just say is she, her mom was Indian and I don't know her background. So her mom was Indian. Mm -hmm. And so, so her dad was Jamaican. Jamaican. Okay. 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 Gotcha. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't see what the big deal is. Exactly. Uh, okay. I just make. I think a good way of putting it. So, um, <laughs> after uh, you guys remember when um uh Joe Biden went on the Breakfast Club and he ha has said the like you ain't black like if you vote you know don't vote for me yeah. comment. Oh yeah. my um, god. So I started listening to that show after that. I was like, oh man, I guess I'm interested people on here. And uh, you know, one of the one of the hosts on there is Charlemagne the God. Uh. He has a his, he says this frequently. I think it's a great way of putting it. Is like at any level, any set of positions. You know, we're talking about like corporate executives or politics or whatever. He's like, thirteen percent of the population is black. Thirteen percent of those people should be black. And I think it's a great way of looking at it. Is like any place where we we see where there's enough people to take a sample size, and we see that instead, you know, if there's thousands of politicians across the U.S. and we see that two percent of them are black instead of thirteen, that's a problem. That something happened there, something mm -hmm. something involving inequality, something systemic happened there. Yeah, uh, it's not just coincidence. Oh, oh, black people don't want to go into politics. No, no, it's not coincidence. Well, I would say you don't like. Sure, the recognition is part of it, but I don't think you elect based on those percentages. You you fix it at the root, so you do get exactly. more black people interested. Yeah. yeah, because a lot of black people aren't interested in politics in in the circle I work with. You know what I mean? They're all not really looking past today. You know what I mean? Or, or I mean, frankly, I work with young men, and and it's their dreams of going in in the NBA or NFL. You know, they're 24, and I'm thinking, no, you, you're not even applying yourself. So it's like, I do think there's an education community building. But I do, I, I've, and I'm not saying you said this, Keith, but I do know a lot of people who are like, no, we should have these number of seats designated for, you know, equality. And I really don't think that's, that's not how I would like to do it. Maybe it's racially insensitive, but I don't, I think quality matters. But then we have to be fixing it at the root. And then eventually it would just yeah. naturally be that way. Yeah. What yeah. what gets someone to be a CEO or a politician? It starts, it starts, frankly, probably based on which grade school you're going to. Certain people in certain areas of the country are more likely or, or areas of cities. And, you know, it goes beyond to, hey, what, what districts are represented? You know, wh how many black people live in certain districts that are easy to win when you talk about politics? There's all these different levels that get to the point before you talk about the percentage 
of black or whatever race in the House of Representatives. Yeah. Is a minority. When do we reach equality? When does that happen? I can I can tell you what um, what Trevor Noah said. Because right. Trevor Noah, I thought, made a great point. He's like the fact that it's brought up shows you there's a problem. Once once there's no longer a problem, it won't even be brought up. But what is equality? I mean, this is one of those things where we know that there is a systemic racism in the United States. It just there is. There is. And to deny that is yeah. you you just can't deny it. I think most people today um, maybe five years ago most people wouldn't admit that. I think most people today do admit that there's something systemic. Yeah. And I think by recognizing it, I think is how we get rid of it. it, it the fact that, you know, we civil rights in the sixties I mean it was recognized back then for sure. Even before that. You know, so we've been on a journey as a country to try to solve this for a long time. It's not like this is just like it's not like George Floyd brought up something that was brand new to us as a country. Oh no. So this is where I think the discussion, you know, for me, I like to see the discussion kind of moved away from just a person's the color of their skin mm. to privilege. You know, because me personally, I I'll, I don't know anyone, I'll never know anyone who who's anything like Privileged like maybe Obama. Privileged maybe like Oprah. Privileged maybe like Morgan Freeman. I, I can keep on going on and on. Or any or basketball star you could pick. Like, so, but they they were absolutely... Isn't that the American dream? Yeah, but I think you're looking at the exception. I'm not saying that the rule. prejudice doesn't exist or discrimination yeah. doesn't exist or biases don't exist. I'm I'm almost saying I don't think that's ever going to go away when we have different groups. I think there are, you're already starting to see it go away in other parts of the world, though. Um, in some places, it's fully gone away. So, I mean, I think we can get there quite easily. I have a, a theory. Gumby actually birthed this idea. We were talking one day, and, and he said, instead of a, a racial privilege, white privilege, for example, what about like a socioeconomic privilege where, you know, the middle class has a certain amount of privilege, a middle privilege, and the upper class has upper privilege, you know, like that, that's a little less offensive. And I do think it's easier to identify, okay, what do you need to give to work on mm -hmm. like the, the, because it doesn't really matter the color, you know, when it comes to that. But I think if you fix the brokenness of, of poverty, that will go a long way to fix all that. Thank stuff. you. And that, you know, until a discussion is moved towards like wealth privilege or something along mm -hmm. the lines of that, where we're just going to keep chasing our own tails with trying to solve every different race. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, I mean, the Native Americans are still fighting for it, right? Our country I think that founded. I think that, that would go a, har a far, pretty far. But, um, I mean, I think we're always going to be fighting different forms of inequality. Like, there's definitely the social economic inequality, which cuts across races. But even when you talk about, um, I remember going back to the Breakfast Club again, there was an interview with um, Robert L. Johnson, who was the former CEO of um, BET, and was the first black billionaire. Mm -hmm. And he's telling stories about being a billionaire and being, you know, questioned about that Porsche out front being his car mm -hmm. or going to... Um, ride horses at, a, at another, you know, fellow little rich person's ranch and being assumed to be, you know, one of the, you know, stable boys. And so you could solve, um, you know, economic inequality and still have, you know, disproportionate police brutality against different races, for instance. You could still have, I think these issues would be a lot, lot less because there would be a certain level of upward mobility that can cover over a lot of problems, but it wouldn't go away. I think it would lessen a little bit because I think the stereotypes by nature um, would go away. I mean, sure, you have differences in culture, you know, that would perpetuate other stereotypes, but I don't think they're as as bad. You know what I mean? I think it's like exposure. If you live in the upper suburbs and you see like like inner city community, it's not the fact that it 
like if a white person dressed a certain way, you would make the same accusations as a, a, a black person that dresses a certain way. You know what I mean? So I, I think there's just there's prejudice and judgmentalness. And I think uh, at the economic level, it would address a lot of that. Yeah. But not all of it. You're right. Yeah. I mean, it's still but there's, exist, yeah. it would still exist because, for example, prime prime example, because I still hear this from people. Right. So you see you see a white kid walking in the street with his pants sagging. And what do they say? Oh, he's dressing like he's black. At the same time, I see a really, uh, you know, really clean cut black guy, you know, dressed up, looking nice, and like, oh, yeah, he's dressing more like he's white. And I hear these comments still to this day from people I know. Um, just just two days ago, uh, there was um, four black people on scooters going out. They dressed very nice downtown. You could tell they're just having a blast because good natured people. And, but they were dressed nice, right? And, you, and they were on scooters going, you know, going across downtown. And uh, one of the one of the people that was walking next to me, they were, they said, "See, I told you, because of all the stuff going on, there's more black people doing white stuff." Mm. <laughs> and and <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it that struck me. I'm like, oh my lord, I cannot believe I just heard that. <laughs> well, I mean, in his defense, black people say the same thing about you know, like the whole Uncle Tom. Like you have to look the part of the culture, or else you can be persecuted. I mean, I see it all the time. Yeah. You know, and let's ask the question: Is there something wrong with wanting to sag your pants and look quote unquote black? <laughs> is there something inherently wrong with that? Well, nah, I wouldn't say so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, is, well, is there something wrong with a black person wanting to look? preppy or white well i think uh you know for me it's sort of the whole you have to know your audience you know if you're gonna yeah. sag your pants to a job interview or you know what you get a tattoo on your face no exactly. matter what color right. you're gonna have this you know what you're walking into if you're surprised by how someone receives you because it's so public you know again it's kind of a shame on you <laughs> i'm just thinking like when i was a child and i was just having this talk the other day with jen i'm like when i was a child growing up and you know i was really into basketball before I realized my dreams of ever making it to the NBA stopped at around eighth grade. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm like, man, me and everyone who was around me wanted to be like Michael Jordan. We wanted to be Mike. Mm. Like Mike, if I could be like Mike. I mean, that was (laughs) ingrained in so many who did follow basketball and sports. I didn't care about the color of his skin. I thought it was cool. I didn't really think about it. You know, and... I don't think I was alone in that. There were a lot of white kids, right, who wanted that too. Right. Yeah. And before the great fall of Cosby, <laughs> who didn't want to be a part of that family? You closed your eyes and you could just picture you yourself there with that family, you know, on his lap just because of who he was as a person and what they portrayed, you know, what a family could be. Whatever. I wanted to hang with the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, that's what I mean. So I, but why is it like, cause I know, I know some, uh, I know black families that are actually voting Republican, but why is it when they want that or they want to dress a certain way, they're labeled as, uh, uncle Tom's or whatever it is, you know, whatever negative, uh, Foundation. I, yeah. yeah. So it still works both ways. I yeah. mean, it, 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 and it's true. It does, but. Well, I do think, I mean, there's stuff that's just, we're not going to be a good, we are a species that identifies differences for survival. You know what I mean? If you see something that is out of characteristic of whatever your comfort zone is, you're going to react and sometimes poorly, but it that's just evolution and survival. And to some extent, I mean, I, I, I know white babies do it and I know black babies do it. I was talking to one of my friends the other day and he says, you know, he was standing in line or his aunt had a baby and was standing in line and, and a really dark black person, he was black and the baby was black, but a really dark black person walked in and the baby started crying. And, and I've seen white kids do it. And I've seen dogs do it. This is not being taught racism. This is just like, this is different and I don't know what to do. And it creates a chemical response. You know what I mean? There's always mm-hmm. going to be that. We just have to be emotionally intelligent enough at our certain age. Kind of like when, um, <laughs> kind of like when I shaved, um, yeah, when exactly. My, when my babies didn't recognize me, the because <gasps> I I'd, I'd, I'd had the goatee on, right? Yeah, and so I I shaved it all off, and they're oh, who is that? They start Mom. crying. <laughs> <laughs> so this really hits at the specifics that Kamala didn't really go into because her speech was a very brief 
foray into a bunch of different generalities. Yeah, it was crazy. But the specifics behind uh, ending systemic racism, especially in policing, or the goals of Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, isn't let's change people's hearts. It's about specific actions to brunt the effects of our natural tendency towards racism in cases where it can really hurt or kill people. So for instance, you know, ending a qualified immunity of police officers. So there actually are real consequences when they shoot people and they mm-hmm. shouldn't have, because there seems to be a natural tendency towards, you know, black people seem to get disproportionately shot by the police. Um, or, you know, even certain things around, you know, college acceptance or schools. So, you know, making sure schools are funded properly so that if you live in a primary black neighborhood, it isn't just, well, everybody's, you know, has less money here. So we fund the schools less. Like, Taking those real effects, like that, that black people have historically had less income, less wealth built over time, and making the disastrous long-term effects of that much less so, even if we continue to remain a racist in our heart society. Hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. There has to be for me. It's all about putting something on paper. There are steps you can take to improve. And until someone's putting these steps down, you know, it really does bother me that the government at some point, the police force or something is not identifying certain uh, steps to at least appease some of this heat and conflict. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. I do believe that also the police need to be protected too. You know, they're like, they can't, like, I do feel like their skin's in the game crazy, but, but I'm open. Let's, let's get the discussion moving. Uh, I'm afraid that we're at war amongst each other way more often. And so we're not holding the government's feet to the fire to produce these steps. We're just like, no, you're racist. You're racist. I'm not racist. You're liberal. You're, you know, all this kind of stuff. But no one's, we're focusing on the wrong thing. And we have media that stokes the fire. Correct. You know, in, in any situation, any of the shootings that have come out, what bothers me the most is that whatever information gets out there first, it cements in the mind. Mm. And whichever side you end up choosing, whether they were justified or not justified or wherever wherever it is you land, it's hard to break from that initial cement. It's Mm. like it's ingrained. And then you start building upon that, your preconceived notions that you want that to be true. So I think the media needs to be more responsible and not throwing out irresponsible information all at once or little bits and pieces first. I I think we need a broader picture, more balanced facts when something like this, because we know it's going to light a fire now. And yet some of the stuff that gets out there isn't balanced. Yeah, it's it's definitely, I would say, anytime a shooting happens, it's immediately like, another racist shooting happened. You know what I mean? Every single time it's going to be that. And and that's just part of the consequence of where we are in time but that does need to be improved too yeah join us for the rest of the conversation in part two